can't have this conversation without asking how you guys met. And I'll start with you, Richard. What, how, how is Richard Pepler? That's a good story. That's a good story. <laughs> well, we, so, this is going to be like law and order. Here's the law and here's the order. This is, this is a good story. This is, this is an absolutely true story. So when I was a, a young, I was a young guy, I was like taking my way, and I didn't have any money, and I didn't have any. We had a job. I did barely, and I didn't know anyone, and uh, I was just kind of arrived here, and I, and I was making my way. And I met Russell through a mutual friend, and Russell was already a big shot, and he was. A, what year was this? This is probably um, late '80s. Let's say late '89, right before I came to HBO, and very nice. And Russell was a big shot, and he was uh, uh, famous already, and he had money, and he he he, um, he had a lot of pretty girls around and everything. So I went to him with my mutual friend, and I said, "What do you? What the hell do you do, man?" Where were we? We were we were in uh, the Hamptons. Broke ass Richard in the Hamptons. <laughs> 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 I was a little, little, you know, fisher, and I was running and sharing a room in a shitty little house. It's barely had enough money to go to the movies. Absolutely true. But it's the Hamptons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I could like, get out to the Hamptons on the fucking uh, <laughs> on the bus. But I, so I meet Russell, who's surrounded by uh, a lot of very pretty girls, and he's very rich, and he's successful. And uh, I'm just trying to find my way, and I'm not at HBO yet, and I really am making some documentaries. And, and I look at him, and, and I say to him, man, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm in, I'm in the hip hop business. I said, I can do that. <laughs> I can do that. And we took a walk and he put his arm on my shoulder and he said, listen, that's not going to be for you. <laughs> but, but, I think. I think the story's evolved so much. I think <laughs> there might be a career for you. There might be a career for you in more traditional realm of television. <laughs> and that actually was a really real conversation and, um, and, and helped steer me to HBO. And the real truth uh, underneath that funny story, which happens to be a true story, is that Russell was supportive of me and cheered for me and was rooting for me to make my way way before I had any position. You went out with the sister of the girl. I do. Right? He fixed me up. That's very, right. That's true. <laughs> but Russell was a big, big cheerleader and and a great very friend. hood girl. And too. <laughs> <laughs> Very good girl. Good family. That's not. I am. This is sexual limitations on that. We'll yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 that's not sexist to say she was hood, right? Yeah. A statue. Yeah. What yeah. Just, okay. Just can I can I give a compliment to you, please? I'm trying to give a compliment. <laughs> Which is, this guy's been a, a friend and a cheerleader and a supporter way before uh, there was anything I could do um, to help him, and um, the, the great treasure for me is, and, and now my family, um, is to have Russell in our life, and we always feel that way, and we cheer for each other, we root each other, and the fact that we now have the blessing and the privilege of being able to do some business together to serve the larger culture is just uh, really an act of God, so I'm always grateful to you. <laughs> Let's hear your take, your side of this. That's pretty. That's pretty. I mean, well, I don't know. If they said you ain't gonna never be. You know, you're not, you're not gonna make it in hip hop. But it's not what you said. I what you said was much more true than that. You said this. This not for you. That story is pretty much kind of true. I don't think there's anything missed wrong about it. Yeah. No, but no. um. It, yeah, it was. We've been friends for that long, and we did meet on the beach, and then we would spend a lot of time together. And over the years, and I went to his wedding, you know, and went to mine. We've been friends for a very long time. But what you? Because I think when you hear this conversation, I think uh, not dating the thing. same family. Well, I say that because that's just you know how close we were. Well, yeah, but happened. also it's that thing where, mm -hmm. in Tipping Point, he talks about connectors yeah. and maybe. Yeah. And I wonder if yeah. you guys recognize something in the other. That's a really. That's a, it's no surprise. Let me recognize something in Richard. Great question. Richard 
realizes that he needs, you know, diversity and input and in a way that most of Hollywood does not. Very, very important because the lack of uh, inclusivity and the lack of understanding of a lot of the cultural nuances is, is an Achilles heel for Hollywood. But Richard is always, and you know, always go back from 27 years ago, we were doing a 25 year anniversary somewhere. Uh, but, you know, um, and um, doing that, we, we go back with, they put all these people on the stage and no one would ever give a break to. Them, right? And, and nobody got a break after that show. People who would, a lot of time the industry had reached around the guys who built careers in this industry and put who they thought made sense, but guys who already built black followings never get to cross over. But basically the blander version of those guys. The, the blander place. version of those guys. I can't even make a movie now. Thank God I'm doing Death County again because you can't make a movie. Say with Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart ain't the only black, but he is pretty much the only lead. I think uh, you're, you're, you're very nice to and this. They, and they also, even after that, you know, they reached, they, HBO has reached into the, the core of the community and, and broke two more stars and nobody else gave a break to any of the people. That was, that's really his leadership. Yeah, well, you know, it's nice of you to say, but it really isn't me. It's really the culture and the DNA of the place that I have the privilege uh, of, of leading. Um, always since I came here in May 1992, um, there's always been an ethos at our place, certainly at our best, um, <coughs> that we wanted to tell stories nobody else is telling, that we wanted to be differentiated from the main, and that we wanted to have impact. You know, And, and I have to say, and it really goes back to the early roots of original programming at HBO, that um, we were going to take some chances. We were going to be a little bolder. We had a response. I know this sounds a little corny, but it actually really informed the very beginning of HBO's ethos. We were going to make a difference. you know. And so a lot of our programming over an extended period of time, it, it, it has the virtue of truth that we've tried to have impact in the larger culture. And in order to do that effectively, you have to tell stories that other people aren't telling. And in order to do that effectively, you have to have a lot of people in the house with different perspectives, <coughs> different sensibilities, different points of view, who can help you tell those stories to a, a, a broader culture. And even we, who try very hard to get this right, are nowhere near as good as we need to be to realize our full potential. And we're thinking about it all the time. We have a show coming. Um, by a young uh, talent named Issa Rae, um, yeah. is called Insecure. And um, our team really discovered a show on the internet which was called Awkward Black Girl. And it's, it's something I'm, I'm very proud and happy to say, and I told her this this morning, it's something very special. I don't think you've seen it before. Um, I think it's authenticity and it's heart. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's very, very transcendent in the sense that it's, there's a purity to its original voice that I haven't seen anywhere before. And um, I think the other thing you need to be very mindful of, if you're sitting in my chair, I'm 57 years old, I live in New York City, um, you have to be very careful that you're listening to your team and that you're broadening your team, all demos, uh, all, all, all different sensibilities, uh, and, and uh, that's where diversity comes into play. If I sit here and think I have the answers to the programming puzzle, that's a, that's a giant mistake I'm gonna make, which I refuse to make. My, the line I have is, when you're in my chair, you need to be militant about guarding against the forces of excessive deference, right? Because there's a tendency, when you're in my chair, for people to come in and, and, and be deferential. And um, you're the CEO, they wanna be deferential, they wanna give you what you think, what they think you want, that's very dangerous. And so you, you need to create a culture and an environment where all kinds of different sensibilities are coming in. A, not afraid to tell you you're wrong. B, not afraid to tell you you're missing something. And C, not afraid to tell you not only are you missing something, here's why you're missing it, and they need to feel comfortable enough to say that to you and know they're not gonna get thrown out of the room. And the real art of leadership is to create that environment because then you get not only the Russell Simmons of the world and the Issa Rays of the world, and all kinds of different points of view, but you're gonna paint on a bigger canvas and you're gonna get a lot more jewels 
into your network than if you sit there pontificating from on high or even with your core team pontificating on him. That's the greatest danger in a creative culture. And we work really hard to fight against it. So you're sweet to say, me is not me. Yeah, but it's really the culture <coughs> that that is, we, you know, we did in gender. Yes. When we did probably 10 years of deaf comedy. Let me get, and we did I, 10 years of deaf poetry. Let me ask you what your first Every year, I would go to Richard's office. <laughs> okay. And, and it's true, Richard would make it. And, and, and all those years, we were getting subscribers in ways that were really meaningful and made a difference. And Richard, instinct to trust in people. If maybe the, the team is not all he wants, he would reach out, like he said. I mean, he, you know, it is true that Hollywood is such a segregated place. And the lack of uh, inclusivity and but insight. Also, the lack, so, of, the lack so of entry. The lack of entry, lack of all those things, right? But Richard would reach out. Look, it's true that with people, the most progressive, activist, sweetest, <coughs> nicest, well-wishing people in the world, he got no black friends. <laughs> got no black friends. But they love black people. Richard has made, not friends only with me, but many uh, leadership in his community and many cultural uh, leaders and, and has listened to them in ways that Hollywood has not listened. And he's, it's come from the top down. And I, and I think that, you know, if he leaves, I could get fired up. You know, I mean, I, my, my first little deal might go away because I'm not saying that in a bad way, I'm just saying. Richard says, no, we're gonna listen to these people. And you know, even if the executives don't show up, all of them, it's what, how does he make sure that these voices are heard? And he, as a leader, has done more, you know, you well, your hair. I mean, this, you, was you, the, tr the truth of the matter is, if you're serving your, if you're serving your enterprise well, which I spend 24/7 thinking about and waking up about, how do you serve? This is a great privilege to have the opportunity to lead a company like this, which has the blessing, really, being able to do all different kinds of things: documentaries, half hours, comedy specials, boxing. Sports documentaries, hour dramas, half hour dramas, John Oliver's, you know, Silicon Valley's, Issa Rae's. We can do a lot of different things because we don't sell advertising and we're not looking necessarily for the largest number of eyeballs to sell the most ads. We're looking to do something a little different, which is to elevate this brand. And the way you elevate this brand is you tell great stories and you entertain, but you engage and you build addicts across a wide section of the citizenry. And in order to do that, it's only common sense that you want to have as many different perspectives thinking with you, talking to you, educating you, right? So that you can bring in as many different voices as possible. If you're not doing that, if you're playing in your <coughs> mold, you're just going to lose out on the opportunity to have your door open to the next great talent. And so, our team found, I don't deserve any credit for finding Issa. I, I just, you know, was part of the obvious decision to say yes to that special voice. And when you see her paint, you say to yourself, as I, I said this to her this morning, I said, when I finished your series, I was by myself in the, you know, my little den watching the thing, and I, and I said out loud to myself, holy shit. Holy shit! I mean, this girl is doing something different. And there's a great line of um, that Barishnikov had about Fred Astaire. He said, "The rest of us are dancing; he's doing something else." And and we wanna we wanna always be doing something else. And I think we wanna be working with people so you who wanna be doing something. You talk about Barishnikov and Fred Astaire. For me, black culture is the equivalent of being gingerized with Fred Astaire, which is yeah, yeah, everything he, he, he does, does except in heels backwards. backwards. In heels backwards. And, and, and yeah. he back, exactly. Yeah. I want to ask you, Russell, when you had the first conversation with Richard about deaf comedy, and what was that? Because you knew going in, you had to give him well, the no, idea of what he wanted. It is very similar today. When I talked about, you know, I have a movie over Fox, right? And there's no lead. There's no lead, I would put a deaf picture in Brando. But yet, every Wednesday, I sell out a big theater, every Wednesday. And I put black comics on the stage. And some come up that I say, oh my God, whatever happened to Michael Collier? Whatever happened to Mr. Cooper? Whatever happened? So there's all these guys who, who were on Def Comedy Jam. You know, Kevin Hart was on there, J.B. Smooth was on there. So whatever happened, these guys didn't make it. Huh? They sell a lot of tickets in the black community. And what about these new guys 
who are a little more edgy than the shit Hollywood is choosing. They get my stage. Some of the guys who get a break in Hollywood, they play my stage too. They don't bomb, they're just okay. But the real stars of the community are not exposed. So what we did then, and right now they're bottled up, waiting, just the way Martin and Jamie and Cedric and Bernie Mac and Chris Tucker and Dave Chappelle and Steve Harvey and, and Mr. Cooper and God knows, there's 20 more that became big stars after that nobody. What do you make of that? What is that? It's the white executive reaching around the black <laughs> talent and choosing who they think is good versus what the community has already chosen was selling tickets. I gotta tell you, you know, when I saw Jamie Smooth the first time. He was on Jeff Comedy Jeff 25 years ago now. But he's been I, playing over and over again. I, but, 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 until you put him on that show, you but, guys well, Larry, decided to put Larry, him on. Larry did it, but, but let me just say that another thing. The first time I saw that guy, it's almost like the first time I, I saw Chappelle. You say the uh, Fred Astaire, first you thing, you say, that guy's doing something different. And uh, I said that with J.B. Smooth. And you become an addict to that voice because you know, man, that guy's painting with 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 different paints. You know that that's. But, but, I, but I think it's also it's the. <coughs> but also, there's a lot of guys. Because as a black person, you have to observe the culture, your culture, and the greater culture. So I think I think that um, I, I don't think we're so or I'm so uh, unique. I mean, I take your word of your experience. I I obviously you know your experience far better than I do. But I just think at our place, I can only speak to our place. At our place, we're so like uh, predisposed, inclined to find great talent that um, it, it, we're just the window is open all the time here, and the the DNA, if you will, of all the team is canvassing about to look for the next great voices. Now we need help, right? And so. The, what I always say to you, as you know, for years, I say it to Spike, I, I say it to everybody, which is, help us. We, we, are, we are ready, willing, and able. Help us. And, um, you know, now I'll say it to Issa, right, because she's now in the family. And I'll say, help us, uh, because we, we are, we are uh, in danger, if we are not listening and not asking for help, uh, of only seeing our inbox, you know? And your inbox in a highly competitive world can get very parochial, right? So you need your inbox to be opened up by the friends of the court and by the family, uh, people like Russell, who are saying, hey, look over here. And the good news about our place is you don't have to say look over here too many times. About I don't just mean, by the way, I mean in front of the camera and behind the camera. And it, it should be noted <coughs> that on, that on, no, uh, on Insecure, um, there is. Uh, both black director and showrunner, and there's a whole team. And we did that. We took a shot at because there wasn't great, you know, um, ex, you know, necessarily experience. There wasn't because we, the opportunities aren't given, so it's not the experience. We did, and we did, and we said, "Let's do it." And boy, were we right! And when I sent, you know, my first my first emails out saying thank you, thank you, um, they weren't just to Issa, they were to Michelle, they were to everybody. So I think, look, we are hardly perfect and we got a long way to go and I'm always aggravated um, by uh, by us not doing enough in this area I don't think we do enough I think we try hard I think your point applies to us too your criticism of Hollywood also has to apply to us which is good hearts spirit is in the right direction not not doing enough the difference uh, that, 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 that I think we try to focus on all the time is we're not doing anybody any favors. We're doing it because it's smart for our brand and our business to get <coughs> a range of storytelling and to capture the uh, 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 voice of the country in all of its forms. If we don't do that, we're idiots. Hmm. But Richard, you know, like, what, what I was saying, saying about how to reach it, I mean, it, it, again, well intentioned, but. There is this, you did give J.B. Smoove that break, and Kevin Hart did make himself. Nobody made Kevin. No one liked Kevin. <coughs> Kevin made himself. Made his own movies until the point when Hollywood said, let's make a movie with him. You know, so it, 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 there is a lack of insight. You know, and honesty is a funny thing. You don't have to know what the fuck Bernie Mac said. 
<laughs> I don't know what the fuck. I mean, I remember I shot a pilot with him after we shot him. Jeff Conner, we shot a pilot for, for a fox or somebody. Like, what the fuck is he saying? Like, he saying? Son of a bitch. I didn't, I didn't know what he was saying. But you know how many times Bernie Mac had to say son of a bitch before I knew what he was saying? So, but it was cultural, it was honest, it was authentic. Authentic. And that authenticity is why it, the, so many of those guys broke through. Let me ask you said lack of, is it lack of insight or is it lack of entry? Because for me, finally... Entry and insight. Well, yeah, because, but you know, they choose, they choose. I, I, listen, I've said this before, people have misunderstood me. But I gotta give you the best example. Because they're, they're really funny, they're really uh, 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 great comedians. When I said, well, what about black comedy? And the comedy says, well, we have Keenan Peel. Like, I never met a black person who said, the black people are coming, let me act black. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I'm not saying they're bad, but they're not bad. It's just they're a certain thing, but there's always something that America has gotten from urban ideas, <coughs> black, ins black ideas that are a little edgy, a little make you scratch your head, a little bit more interesting. And that's where the, the, the great talents that go beyond just accessible come from. Yeah. That's where the Martin and Jamie and Chris talked and Dave Chappelle, because they had a, a thing beyond that. And, and that's an honest representation of a specific culture that Can speaks to the mainstream. No, no, sure, no, sure. Come back. So, no, no, you go ahead. I'll make it a point that probably going to No, I don't want to jump on your point. Go ahead. I don't even know what the point is. I want to go back to this point. I want to make a political cultural point, though, that I think is also important. And that is. Because I'm going to ask you, what do you think both made about this? A lot of people here are going to. It's going to find. You talk about insight, but it's still entry. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's still the issue. I mean, I mean, the minute you put J.B. Smoove on an integrated show, it's like, wow! But he's been 25 years waiting. Yeah. I, Kevin, I, I, Kevin Hart doing those documents you pay for himself, they, you play for black audiences. I'm sorry. I, I'm gonna, I, let, me make, let me make the meta point and then go to the, go to the entry point. The meta point is that um, <coughs> what we're seeing now in the political landscape of the country um, scares the shit out of me. It's a, uh, a passionate... Um, participant in, uh, as a citizen in uh, the political process. And it scares the shit out of me because I think what's happening in the country, yeah. the level of divisiveness that's informed this political debate, uh, what we're seeing on the streets of Charlotte, what we're seeing on the streets of Chicago, this is a very, very dangerous thing. And there are political solutions to some of these problems public policy solutions which need to address them. But one of the most important dimensions of, of beginning to heal this country is cultural. And our artists, our musicians, our comedians, our, our actors and actresses and directors and writers and producers are going to go a long way toward beginning to show the better angels of our country to each other. I watched uh, over the vacation summer vacation to kill a mockingbird with my 13 year old. It's, it's when I saw it when I was 12 or 13 years old. And uh, my parents showed it to me when I was that age because it was such an interesting, emotionally, cultural, um, a resonant piece about bigotry, right? And about racism. And you show that to a kid and it almost trumps any school book you could read. And, she, and my daughter is now reading, thankfully, to kill a mockingbird in her class. And I just thought, you know, what that movie did um, over time and what that book did. It's, it shows the power of culture to inform the citizenry. And so I think all this that we're talking about, I'll get to entry in one second, is not only important because of what we do for a living, it's important because it's a piece of, uh, uh, an ingredient that can help heal the country, at least put us back onto a little bit more equilibrium. We're never going to get rid of, you know, in politics there's a great adage which is when you look at the voting population and you're campaigning, you got to shore up your supporters. You got to forget those militant opponents. You know, there's there's 30, 35 percent of the country that's locked into a sensibility. We ain't never going to change, right? And gerrymandering helps too because gerrymandering it ensures it. It ensures it. Yeah. So you got to shore up your supporters, but you got to go get the middle, and you got to bring the middle over to the enlightened, and you got to bring the middle over to the informed. And I think that's what is so important it's just like the about the Russell. Now you go back to entry, which is if you are in these chairs and you care about your culture and you care about your politics, interestingly, and I'm not saying we sit here as kind of pseudo-politicians, but we are part of the cultural conversation. 
And if you can inform the culture to the better angels of our nature, that's a tremendous opportunity and responsibility. And that should inform a predisposition to entry because without it, you can't begin the healing. And we are going to see over the course of the next, whatever it is, 60 days, we're going to see some wild shit. And it is going to be really scary. And I think we're going to come out okay on, on the other end. But the residue of what's going to be left is going to be a tremendous amount of anger and bitterness and hostility. And there can be a, as many talk shows as you want and as many radio shows as you want, as many internet chats as you want. The way to get above the rage and the dissonance in the country is this business. I, this business can do more agree with you. than I mean. uh, than any public policy decision that could be made. So I, I sorry long-winded, no, no. but I'm, I'm getting at entry because what I mean is we need to think about that beyond just the business because the healers are the truth tellers and the truth tellers are the artists and we need to find a way to integrate truth telling and artistry into the culture. Well, I want to speak to that because it is true. that you should clap because that's important. Uh, as you said, regarding the artists, I mean, mostly the artists are the ones with the heart because where does the art come from but inside? And inside of you is the better angel, the more compassionate, the more loving, the more... All that stuff is here. All the stuff on the outside is the noise that separates you from here. So artists have always spoken up. They've been, they've been the compassionate ones. They've been the ones who have fought for social justice in every case, in every society. It's not only us. So giving the artist voice moves us forward in a way that makes us love each other more and makes us see each other, see each other better, right? And I think that's that's why it's so important to make sure that the the, the storytellers, the gate and the gatekeepers keepers of those storytellers are open to, to take a chance yeah. and to have courage and to tell the truth. A lot of the truth, right now, it's almost some of the truth is like, they question it right there in the scripture. <laughs> it's promised over and over again in every scripture. But yet it's still struggle with telling it. And there's this anger that's taking over and, and we really, culture is what's kept us where we are yeah. and gotten us where we are. Yeah. It's it not like if that went away, if it went away, it was just all the noise then people can do anything. When it works, you know how bad people can get? When it works, it lifts us higher, right? When culture is resonant, music, art, you know, it makes us see clearer. And I do go to this point of seeing each other because I think, and this is, this is actually, I, I'm not making a reductive political point here about political campaigns. Um, that's another conversation. I'm making a point about the hatred that I'm observing in my country. And Jefferson had a great, wonderful line um, after the Constitutional Convention. He said, I tremble for my country. And sometimes I feel I tremble for my country when I see the hatred um, out there, misdirected, ignorant, uh, uninformed. And I, I struggle with this a lot. I'm a big runner, and, and I run every night, and I clear my head every night. And, when I run, I, 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 I think through things and whatever, business problem or speech or whatever it is. And I was happened to be thinking last night about this, um, that one of the big problems with our country is we, we don't see each other. And it is a terrible thing. You and I, we, well, you say you, we, we don't see each other. We don't what, see what each other. We, there's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful um, uh, phrase in, in, uh, in Africa when people in a um, particular village, uh, and, and I believe it's in, in Zambia, when they meet each other, they not say hello, they say, I see you, oh, yeah. right? They say, I see you. And what they mean by that is, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at you for your human struggle, for your joy, for your struggle. I see you, do you, do you see me, do you recognize me? And I think there's a tremendous problem in the country when we don't see one another. Mm -hmm. The reason often we don't see one another is because we all get into these very parochial little bubbles and we see the world from the chair we're in. 
So there's a famous line in politics, which is it depends what end of Pennsylvania Avenue you're sitting on, right? If you're in the White House, you see an obstreperous, difficult, fractured, annoying United States Congress. And if you're in the Congress, you see an imperial, uh, uh, ubiquitous, uh, 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 and, and quite frankly, often uh, autocratic presidency. And so depending upon where you're sitting, and my feeling is you have to see one another. And in order to do that, have to take the time. It's funny, you I, I want to say. And let something. me just wrap it with one other point. I in go order ahead. to take the time, you have to be willing to sit down and see it. Well, you, and, but and I want to say something. What we the yogis say, Namaste. Yeah. The, I, you know, God in me acknowledges and sees the God in you. So it's the same thing. And a lot of cultures have this idea of seeing each other. But I, but it, but it makes me. I want to make a point because I'm speaking to people who want to enter Hollywood, and none of you want to enter, and I can promise you, only black Hollywood, because it's broke as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me finish, let me finish. And I say this to you, no, I say this to you, because even those who are succeeding in black Hollywood are comfortable there. And I don't want you to go out into, into Hollywood and say, I want to work for black Hollywood. You speak English. Your stories are universal. The idea of integration, you fought for it. The lack of integration or, in, or, or uh, ability to socialize. Doors are open. You got to walk in the door. I don't want to go there, man. All white people in. Right? They say it all the time. But you have the same interest. A story, a melody is a melody. A beautiful song, the melody is there. doesn't have anything to do with race. So you have to go out and... In, like, you know, there's, a, there's a lack of integration. You think there's a black agent in Hollywood? You think there's one? No. <laughs> the one, he, but he didn't really, but he was the blackest, the one big black star, he's gone. When a black star becomes a star, when you become Will Smith, and you worked hard, and you had your black agent, and your agent <laughs> is not in the room. I, I, was it Will Smith the only idea? I mean, Denzel, name anybody? When, you're, when you, your agent didn't go where you are propelled to, then you got to get rid of them. So if you're an agent and you represent black talent and you're not there where they need to go, then you're going to get fired. And, if, and, and so you need to integrate as well. It's not for them to constantly reach for you. It's for you to be standing there. You know, it's and, I, and I said it to you because I want, I want to share that because I think that that's something that doesn't seem it's to resonate and maybe just trained. It's interesting. The most grassroots democratic part of the entertainment world, the music business. Always has been. Always has been. Because it's a small you, 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 can you can't stop them. There's no gatekeepers. Exactly. And throw a record out the window. So you write place. your melody, you can perform it, you don't need anybody to, to release it or to shoot it. Jay-Z said, you know, nigga, I put it on the soundtrack, everybody's mad and shit. Well, it don't make no difference. If I put it on a nutty professor music, soundtrack or not, you know, music is not. <laughs> <laughs> even, even more so now than ever, right? Where let it go. Now, here's what's interesting, and I don't mean to keep harking back to Issa is, 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 is the only example, but Issa <laughs> went to YouTube, right? She just took her goods and her talent and her gifts, and she goes on YouTube, and our guys are uh, open enough to see it and smart enough to bring it back into the house and say, whoa, right? Just like Lena Dunham goes to South by Southwest with a $37,000, you know, little home. But she's done web episodes before that, too. And she's done web episodes before that. And, and, and one of our people sees the little tiny furniture movie and brings it back in. The good news about what's starting to happen is that there's, there's going to be and is uh, more and more a, a, a profound opportunity to circumvent traditional gatekeepers with just pure talent, you know? I mean, we have this wonderful documentary coming called The Defiant Ones uh, next year, which is the story of the birth of Interscope and the relationship between Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre and mm -hmm. the birth of uh, Interscope. It's just unbelievable. Great black friend, Alan Hughes. It, bye bye, the great Alan Hughes. And it's unbelievable. It's four, it's, it's four hours. I cried, you know, oh, through so much of it. Um, it's really a beautiful, beautiful thing about art and how art finds its way into the culture and how art is always ahead 
of where the culture is, right? You'll be blown away by it. But there's a great story in there, which I had never heard before, of how Dre found Eminem. And you might know this, but I never knew this. The way Dre found Eminem, Eminem had nowhere to go. Nobody was paying any attention to him. Everybody was throwing Eminem out of his office. And some kid took his little shitty tape, you know, that he had made, and brought it into Dre. And Dre, I don't want to get out ahead of the spoil our documentary, so we'll keep this in the room. But the, but the, uh, oh, that story. But, but the, you know, he takes he takes the he takes the tape, and Dre listens to it and goes, "Holy shit." I found something remarkable. And I think that is an example of what can happen more and more. It's true, you need people in my chair and my colleagues' chairs who are open to that. But if you go back to what I said at the beginning, which is, nobody's, we're not doing a favor to the community to say, oh, let's put this on so we can have a black show. You know, let's put on the, because we got to have because X percent of our audience is African. That's bullshit. We're doing it so we elevate the brand, which is what we do for a living. And if we're telling great stories and we're elevating the brand, it's also good for business. Nobody's doing anybody any favors. But you have to be predisposed and you have to have as many friends in the court as you possibly can. The reason I tell the Dre story is because Eminem, who says this in the, in the thing, Dre saw him. He, nobody else saw him, right? He's a white kid doing hip hop. You know, he says it in the film. He said, you know, everybody, nobody took it. Dre got it. And so there's versions of this on all sides of the story, which is do we see each other? Do we hear each other? Are we predisposed to listening? And if we are, more often than not, we're going to find the jewels. And when you do, then you're looking, everybody goes, oh, wow, how bold, how bold. It's actually not so bold. It's just smart. But see, you're saying something. I wanted to start this with you, Russell, because this is something I think about so often as a kind of guy who does what I do. So often in this culture, black success is looked upon as being a fluke. Well, you know, Tell me, but, but I want to first, uh, I want to come right back to that. I want to first speak a little bit to what Richard said about this digital thing. We have probably 200 main eyeballs. I hate saying that, my office says that. It's 100 million people this month, up from 90 million last month, who view all that digital. And there are people on there, some who made it onto our special, uh, Def Comedy special, some who, there are people on there who are explosive. Lots of people on TV, I have a guy who's on my show, on, just works in our office, six months, he's way more famous than five years in a while now. Did a, a, a Fat Dre thing, the 30 million views, just like that. So there is this new world where talent can be exposed in the way that music could be exposed. No one wanted Ain't No Nigga on the Money Night Professor soundtrack. So you don't have to put it on a nigga, it's gonna be a hit anyway. <laughs> so we didn't make a video for it until after, but you know, I, this idea that music could penetrate despite there's nobody in charge. This is coming up for us. And so talent That's will right. find its way more often. A lot of the older guys, or even uh, in their mid-20s, look beyond it, like, oh, it's just digital. But, but a lot of younger people, people, they don't watch TV. They yeah. ain't thinking about it. But you came from a world where the first time where music broke through without really needing radio, hip-hop was that thing. It became a success before radio caught up with it. Well, that's still, that's still the, the, that's still the, uh, the, but, the, mon the way people work. That's what they do. They make stuff, and the street picks it up, the street makes them play it. Street can't make, you know, um, it can make now digital content or yeah. <coughs> small films that Although Easter Rays. You know, when you see our that. documentary, when you see Dre beginning to do his thing, and you you see they couldn't print the um, they couldn't print the, uh, uh, the, the CDs fast enough. They couldn't they couldn't get them out. He knew he was he had, he had got, he found gold, right? And um, they, then there wasn't, then Jimmy came, you know, and, and embraced them, and there was a real studio involved. But in a way, in this world order, prior to, I mean, this was prior to streaming, prior to the digital, they needed Universal, they needed Interscope. In this day and age, my guess is, you tell me, you're better at this than me, my guess is if Dre emerged now, right, with that kind of originality and that kind of voice, you don't need you don't need anybody. No, of course not. Right. But you know, yeah, we but, but still the street pushed it. The record companies didn't buy it. We Christmas rapping in nineteen seventy nine, we made up a fake order number 
And people were ordering a record and probably get what the fuck, what is this record? It was before, it was actually before Sugar Hill. And Sugar Hill came out, and we know what it is, and the black department was kind of like, we don't like those type of people. So the British guy said, what are these numbers? And the British A&R director bought Curtis Blow, 1979. Um, but it was just numbers to him, you know? But it, it, it really still, music could still penetrate. But today, you're right, music wouldn't need any support but today, also, a lot of the talent, if all the guys I had on my Def Comedy special were interested, because they're 25, they're, they spent time developing their stand-up, it's not easy to be a great stand-up. These guys are a little bit beyond the internet age. Our core demographic is 18 to 24. You know, and they're highly educated, they don't watch TV, and they love this digital revolution. And they love this digital comedy, you know, this urban pop digital comedy. But if these guys that I have on my special or in, on the internet, and we put them on now, and we put them on, they get a million views, 800,000 yeah. views, they are building, but they never really took that as the way, their route. But the next generation, the route will be through places like All Depth Digital. Absolutely, so I, I just say parenthetically to that, which is important, when you see, you know, straight out of Compton, or you come and you see our document, and then you watch the news today, right? It's fascinating, isn't it? Because what these guys were saying, NWA and, and all of that voice, is they were saying there's some shit going on here and it's really bad and you guys don't, don't get it, right? And there are a lot of, this is, this is what I mean by why we don't see each other. And n there was a noble part of the white establishment uh, back in the mid-90s um, that was just looking at that and saying when they heard it, that can't fucking be. That just can't be. So, they're, 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 yeah, it, but, but I'm talking about the birth of, uh, of um, you know, Snoop and everything was, it can't be, I can't believe it's not my country, it's impossible. And the birth of, um, I don't have my iPhone, the birth of smartphones basically said back to the citizenry, check it out. Yeah. Right? But what was ahead of the smartphone? Artists. <laughs> Artists were saying that. And what Jimmy and Russell and everybody were saying to me back in my early days here in the mid-90s was, oh, this shit's happening. And it's, and it's dangerous and it's bad and it's splitting the country up and it's happening. And art, again, was ahead of everything. And think about now when you listen to that music and you put it up against the screen last night, right, in Charlotte, and you put it up against the screen, you know, weeks ago in, 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 in cities all over the country, and you say to yourself, good God, as you say in my house, this has been, this has been going on all the time. This can't be my country. That is a powerful thing. And only art can awaken, right, now technology can too, but art can awaken the consciousness where I begin with our responsibility, our but, opportunity. But it's actually been art moving the technology ahead. I mean, you yeah. think about what hip hop did yeah. by inventing new production, by taking music, doing things with it. It's always been art, and we, we probably got audience questions here. Uh, we have two very lovely women there, because I can take these guys for the next few days. Mm -hmm. But let's give you guys a chance. We have questions here. Uh, how about you, sir, right here? How you doing? Uh, we, no, no, let's pass the microphone to you. Hold on and please just ask a question because we only give everybody a chance. Thank you. How you doing? My name is Akna and Mashariki, and my question for Mr. Pepler is that what's your persuasion? Pepler. 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 To the Hollywood executives of create creating um, your your stories, your your influence. Do do they take your um, advice? You know that that's my question. It's a good question. So well, first of all, I I have m many many friends you know who are you know fantastic executives. Um, everybody. You know, everybody's faced with a different set of circumstances. And I think the worst thing you can ever do is try to impute 
uh, our, either our sensibility or our model or our thinking to anyone that's arrogant and inappropriate. I think what you can do is you can uh, you can you can spark conversation, and as always is the case. The best thing, because you know, many of my colleagues are, are just such, you know, talented and terrific people, um, and by success gets success too, right? Um, so if we can do certain things because we have a model which gives us a little bit more flexibility, sometimes we're given a little bit too much credit for our boldness. But we can do certain things that if you're an ad-supported network and your metric is how many people are watching something, that's how that's how you're judged, that's how you're rewarded or not well, rewarded. How much the sponsors profit? How much do the sponsors? We're in a business, such as I said at the top of the conversation, which is a little different than that. We're serving a larger brand. So sometimes we get a little more credit than we deserve for our risk-taking and our boldness. But I think that our blessing is we can prove that that risk taking pays dividends and thus can translate over to any model. And whether you're an ad supported model, whether you're a theatrical model, whether you're a digital model, if you do, if, if you create stories that reflect the country and you do that in a way which is authentic and, and true and fierce, um, to Russell's point earlier, <coughs> The audience will be there. And I think, and it's worth saying about our show, Insecure, yes, it's the two stars are African American. Yes, they are two African American girls in you know their early 30s living in LA. But my God, the stories are universal. It's love, it's relationships, it's betrayal, it's pain, it's how do you balance your career with your life. How do you make decisions about whether a relationship is working or not working? Uh, what happens when you screw it up? I mean, you can't watch the thing. It doesn't very quickly. It transcends race. And you're watching a human story. It happens to be a human story through the voices of two African American women in their early 30s. But what's beautiful about it is its universality. It's the, it's the idiosyncratic of the person. Exactly. Exactly. So that's how, I'm sorry about long winded, but I think we got to do, it's, my, it's our line to our kids, right? We can't tell other people what to do. You can only worry about your own family. Do what's right, do what's right for you, and if that example is appealing, other people will follow. And I think that's, that's a good way to look at it. Uh, sure. Uh, my question is to both of you, and it's around what you discussed, how art and culture and technology um, can push us forward and really challenge kind of key issues that we deal with socially. I mean, looking at um, our society now, do you not feel that technology and culture can actually push us further away from who we are? And let's take something like Occupy Wall Street or the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, a lot of cultural influencers went down to Occupy Wall Street, but very few of them actually intricately got involved. Uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, there's been a lot of protests around it, there's been a lot of work done, but it doesn't feel like our generations actually got to a point where they realize what they can fight for. Uh, it's not the same as the civil rights movement, ultimately, or no, something like the apartheid me, struggle. Let me dispute that just a bit. Sure. I went to Occupy every day, not because of me, I'm not going to tell you because of me, but Occupy, we got to at least recognize that money controlled our government more than people. And it was because of social media that it traveled the way it did travel, where I went all over the world and it was occupied. <coughs> Unfortunately, you know, the media was able to muffle the message, you know, that Wall Street controlled our government more than the people who voted. Mm -hmm. And that was muffled. The only thing they ratified was a constitutional amendment that we wrote about public funding, right? But it was something that we did, it was a movement that mattered, and social media made it happen. Black Lives Matter, we had a million people or close to a million. You can look at it on uh, C-SPAN or C-SPAN, right? On the mall. No media helped us. Mr. Farrakhan didn't speak to one media outlet except black media. We had a million people in October. And I, we had 100,000 people march here in New York City. And Andrew Cuomo changed the law, made an executive order to get special prosecutors 
in place where innocent or um, unarmed people are shot. So now the attorney general is in charge. This was social media. That march was just announced. You know, Khloe Kardashian and a bunch of people tweeted it, Instagrammed it. And we had a march. And said it was 70, 80% white. But we made a chain. That was a Black Lives Matter march. And so Black Lives Matter has made, I'm going to Detroit Monday. We're going to have a huge rally. It's social media. Tuesday I'll be in Chicago. It's social media. Social media is moving, and I, I tell it to Hillary all the time, I don't fuck wrong. Listen. But, but, they're not, they're not, but social media you know, is the nucleus of a lot of the revolutions we're watching around the world and can be the nucleus but of... But it's also the catalyst for Donald Trump, isn't it? Damn right, just took the sentence out of my mouth. <laughs> what, the, way, the way that those guys began their campaign, thank you for saying it first, is they tweeted, yeah. I'm coming to such and such a place, and I'll be there tomorrow. They had no advance team. They had no organization. They were defying traditional political wisdom, which was you needed a whole advance organization, and this took time, and you had to find a venue. And they just said, hey, we're showing up at such and such an auditorium at 2 o'clock tomorrow. And he got on his plane, and he flew to Cleveland, or wherever the heck he flew to, and it was filled. So here's where we are, right? The, the truth of the matter is, like with any force, it, it can be in the service of good, and it can be in the service of division and hatred. And there is uh, there is sewage on the internet, and there is noble and enlightened the things. G.W. Paps and Lenny Riefenstahl. There you go. <laughs> it's all it's all there. And in the, at the end of the day, you know, again to quote Jefferson, you know, what you want is the sunlight to be the di best disinfectant of what is out there that is poisonous. Now, the truth of the matter is it's very, we, there, we did a documentary with the Southern Poverty Law Center in which we tried to show the power of uh, the Klan and, and right-wing movements, uh, alt-right movements around the country and the way that hate was spreading on the internet and how dangerous that was. There's no questions there. But I think we're not gonna wish it away. What we have to do is show the alternative. And how is the alternative shown most powerfully? Through art, through culture, through music, through television. Television and music are the best way to get into the national conversation you can possibly have. And then those people who become music and television icons can do enormous good transcending politics and just going to this fundamental point that I'm making about seeing each other and hearing each other and understanding what, you know, we, we just did a, a documentary. This is very interesting, because it's a textbook about culture and about our role and our opportunity. We just did a documentary which The Rock did, brought to, to us, which is the story of a rehabilitation program in Dade County, Florida, where young kids who commit nonviolent crimes can have a choice at sentencing, if the judge so chooses, Rather than sending these kids to prison and ruining their life, he sends them into a boot camp program in Dade County, and they have an opportunity to restore themselves through discipline, through commitment. And the beauty of the film, 33 out of the 38 kids who enter um, make it through and graduate. And when you watch the graduation, and the film is beautifully sh uh, rendered because you see the juxtaposition of these kids as they're struggling to get through the boot camp, and their families who are at home waiting for them. It's Obama's great line right when he visited a federal prison on our vice show. Again, another opportunity of using culture to, to, to elevate the conversation. And the President of the United States, first time the President of the United States has gone to a federal prison, and he sits around with a group of African American men. And when you watch that, if you haven't, go watch it up on, 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 on HBO.com, and you see the men rise as the President of the United States comes in. He tells them, please sit, we're having a conversation. And the President looks at them and says what to me is the fundamental line of understanding empathy and seeing one another. He says, you know, I did a lot of, he didn't say fucked up, but I did a lot of shit when I was your age. And I made a lot of mistakes. And the only difference between me and you is I had a bigger margin for error. And you look at the men sitting there and you saw their whole bodies relax. Why? 
because the President of the United States said, no, I see you, right? And in our, our documentary with The Rock, what all those kids want is to be seen. Why is the film important, God willing? Because if the film gets disseminated widely and criminal justice programs around the country see it, and they see what a program like this can do to help rehabilitate and reimagine lives, rather than throw these 19 and 20 year old kids in prison and ruin their lives for the next 10, 20 years. If we can do that, right to your question, then we're nudging the world a little bit here and nudging the world a little bit there. And all we can do together is try in our best way through our different voices to nudge the world forward to the better angels. If we do that enough, we're gonna have an impact. And yeah, all that shit that that, that we know at the beginning, which is all, that'll also be out there. But we're more articulate in our response, which is we do better together than we do apart. That's a great place to go. Thank you. One of the most common mistakes that independent filmmakers make is feeling like your picture is finished when you lock picture. You focus on actors, cinematography, the writing, people spend 10 years on a screenplay, they, it's a labor of love, they get the financing, they lock picture, they finish it, and then they expect to hand it off to someone. And as independent filmmakers in 2010, that's not where it ends. You need to be able to market and understand the distribution of your film. Are we doing Wizard of Oz analogies? Are we really doing this? Go for it. But I mean, <laughs> what they had, what they had before was just fine, and it, they had their own stories, their own way of telling its stories, and each other, and that worked on the yellow brick road to freedom. 